it is showtime. Oh my goodness. I am so sorry. So I have had a terrible night. Um, I have um, been dealing with dogs. I have been dealing with um, a terrible night. Oh, um, shoot. I have um, been dealing with dogs. I have been dealing with I've been dealing with me and I'm an absolute idiot. <laughs> I had my TV on for Mary Lou in case she was here, but she went home um, early. Hi, Lawrence. How are you? Oh, my gosh. Oh, I'm a POS. <laughs> so part of me has not gotten used to the time change yet. And then the other part of me is dealing with dogs, Mary Lou, and all sorts of other things like that. So I apologize for being late. I may just have to do it at a later hour. I don't know. Because the the sun, where it is, that's, that's how I keep track of time. And it being bright out instead of sunset. Oh, I hate, 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 hate. Hate with passion, daylight savings time. Hate it, hate it because it screws me up so bad. And it takes like a month for me to acclimate. And it, um, and it screws me even worse up in winter time. So just, <laughs> just be prepared for that. Justice, hi, how are you? Oh my gosh. Ah, the gang is starting to be here. So yeah. Oh my God. I am complete and utter, just stupid. Just color me stupid. And I, color me stupid. So once again, I want to thank everyone for the help that you guys gave me. Um, a message, shut up. I don't care about the message from the president. I want to sign into my account. And so you guys gave me a hell of a lot of help. And I'm trying to figure out um, this stupid app um, and the way that, I mean, Amazon gave me a payment, but I'm waiting on stupid ass PayPal to give me a payment. And it's... Uh, uh, Ah, so I have money waiting and bless your hearts for sending it, but I hate PayPal. I hate, I hate, I hate, I hate. It takes so long to get money. And then if you press the wrong thing or choose the wrong thing, then the person who sent it has to press something else. And it's just, it's a bloody nightmare. They make it confusing on purpose so they can hold your money as long as possible and not give it to you or have you send it back to the original person while taking the fee out anyway? Uh, um, this is this is why I didn't have a PayPal account. I hate them. I hate them with a bloody passion. So anyway, uh, we are here. We are here. And we are jumping back to Jordan Peterson um, after the prayer series. And um, in the beginning, I would just like to um, open us up with prayer. So if you guys would like to join me, um, here we go. So, Lord God, there are many people who are connected to me who are suffering. And I just wish to pray for their release. Um, you are the God of everything. You are the God of us. You are the God of nature. You are the God of cancer. You are the God of financial disparity. You are the God of everything that is going on and you are a great God. And we know that you, you sent your son, Jesus Christ to die for our sins. And that is the biggest, biggest, biggest sacrifice that could ever be made. I mean, this was in place of 
you know, Isaac um, in, instead of um, the sacrifice of Abraham. Um, and so we just want to thank you right now, Lord God, uh, for everything that you have done for us. But we also want to say that we are in need. We are in need of your intervention. We are in need of the further intervention of Jesus Christ. And you said by his stripes, we are healed. So I wish to send a healing upon all people who need healing right now. The people that I am connected to through YouTube, the people who I am connected through to through, you know, Twitter and TikTok and all these other applications, these people who have sent up a need, you know, we're dealing with addiction and trying to recover with that. We're dealing with cancer and trying to recover with that. We are dealing with migraines that paralyze the body, that paralyze the mind. We are dealing with anxiety and depression and all sorts of other things like that. So Lord God, I just command, as you have given me authority, I command that you send your army of angels to all these different people, to all of them, not a single one overlooked. Not a single, even if I overlook them, Lord God, I know that you will not overlook them. So Lord God, I ask that you send your armies of angels to every one of these people, every single one, and that you bring your healing, that you bring your peace, that you bring your word, that you bring your comfort, that you bring what only you can bring, Lord God, what only you can bring, Lord God, and that is redemption. And that is so many other things. And so I pray this upon my people. I pray this upon the fam, Pam fam. I pray this upon my friends online who have never met me, but they have faith in me, Lord God. They have faith. And so I just ask that you, you bring the salvation that is only possible through you to all the doctors, to all the patients, to everyone everyone and you know who they are lord god so i don't have to name them but i pray that you bring them peace you bring them a resolution to their troubles or if they must go through those troubles i ask that you carry them through in a way that they do not understand but in a way that leads them to the place that they need to be to bring your kingdom here upon earth as you will it, Lord God, if this is a terrible cup that we must drink from, like your son had to drink from, we understand and we take it. We take it upon ourselves, Lord God, because you will it. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I felt the Holy Spirit moving through me then, let me tell you. So, yeah, to everybody that's dealing with all sorts of things, whether it be cancer, whether it be chronic pain, whether it be spiritual and, you know, just physical, emotional maladies of all kinds, all kinds, you know, anxiety, depression, insomnia, even if it seems like a problem that you should not have to be praying for, even if it seems too small for God, don't forget. Don't forget that God takes care of all of these things. Amen. Oh, Shaman's here. All right. Amen, Shaman. Thank you so much. So um, Justice says, I just felt him too. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, it's it's those moments where it's just absolutely amazing. I'm tearing up right now um, because, you know, amazing things happen with you guys. So... Um, we're going back to Jordan Peterson um, and the biblical studies. Um, so uh, Justice says, a few days ago, I was one year since my friend died. I took a picture smoking some marijuana and his name was oddly spelled in the exhale of the smoke. Oh, wow. What a miracle. What a Miracle. Oh my gosh. Justice Salsa says, yes, Pam, that was an overwhelming sense of feeling. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Yeah. Oh, I need to get a tissue now. Hold on. 
And this is just, this is just, oh, there's something magical here. There's something going on. I don't know what it is. And it's certainly not me. It is certainly not me. It may be like the, the, the kismet between all of us. I don't know. I don't know, but there is something here that is just so wonderful. And I love it. I love it. It's, oh, I can reach the tissues now. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, and I am a vain woman hoping that I haven't screwed up my mascara, but I'm sure I have. All right. It's under this eye. <laughs> I love you all. I love you all. You are fantastic. So yes, let us continue with um jordan peterson and let's continue down this path that you know god has put us upon and um yeah i know it's a big mess back there but you know i'm human <laughs> so here we are jordan peterson all right let me start him up to go along with it carl jung when he wrote about the emergence of alchemy or the emergence of science from alchemy he thought of science is being motivated by a dream because for you the dream was the, the dream was the manifestation of the instincts it was the boundary between the instincts and thinking he said well science is nested inside a dream and the dream is that if we investigated the structures of material reality with sufficient attention and truth that we could then learn enough about material reality to alleviate suffering right to produce the philosopher's stone to make everybody wealthy, to make everybody healthy, to make everyone live as long as they wanted to live, or perhaps forever. But that's the goal, to alleviate the catastrophe of existence. And that that idea, the idea that mysteries, the solution to the mysteries of life that might enable us to develop such a substance, or let's say a multitude of substances, provided the motive force for the development of science. And Jung traced that, the development of that motive force really over a thousand years. And if you're interested in reading his books on alchemy, which are extraordinarily difficult, and that's really saying something about Jung, because all of his books are difficult. And then the books on alchemy, they kind of take a quantum leap. That's actually a very small leap, so I shouldn't say that. They take a massive leap into a whole different dimension of complexity. But that's what he was trying to get at. He went back into the alchemical texts and interpreted them as if they were the dream on which science was founded. And Newton was an alchemist, by the way. I mean, Jung's hypotheses are certainly, well, supported by the historical facts, science did emerge out of alchemy. Yes, science did emerge out of alchemy. Um, let me put me on the screen as well. Oh, no, I don't want to do it like that. There we go. Make me smaller. Make Jordan Peterson bigger. That's 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 the proper size. Um, yeah, alchemy turned into chemistry and turned into physics and turned into, you know, well, not so much biology, but yeah, everything else. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it, Young's, I haven't even delved into Young and alchemy yet, um, but I know that it's, it's super empowering. Um, and the idea that yes, this, this is a dream. We, we figure things out in dreams first, and then it, becomes a reality. Um, one of the things that I love, the stories about uh, George Washington Carver, he always brought his book into the lab with him. And he was the one who came up with peanut butter and saved the South after uh, cotton had just absolutely decimated all of their farming. I mean, they couldn't farm anything because cotton just leaches all the nutrients from the soil. So George Washington Carver came up with peanut butter and peanuts return the nutrients to the soil. And so he saved the South. Floki, Floki's here. Oh, bless your heart, sir. Glad to see you. Glad to see you. So, ah, oh, we're getting the fam, Pam fam back. And we are, I, I think I have figured out what was going on with my network connection. So hopefully everything will work out. So, <laughs> and hello, Pam, of course, of course, I can, I considered myself part of the all. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh my gosh. So yeah. Um, you know, we, we start out in dreams. We start out in these abstract thoughts that don't make a lot of sense. 
and then suddenly they become concrete and we understand where we're going from there. And that's kind of like what the biblical stories are telling us because they are more dreamlike than anything. So, um, yeah, let's get back to Jordan and what he says about this. The question is, what were the alchemists up to? And they were trying to produce the Philosopher's Stone, and that was the universal medicament for mankind's pathology. Jung felt that what had happened was that you know, Christianity had promised that, the cessation of suffering, promised it for a thousand years, and yet suffering went on unabated. And at the same time, Christianity had attempted to really put emphasis on spiritual development, let's say, at yes. the expense of material development, right? Thinking of material development as something akin to a sin, trying to get a control of impulsivity and, and all the things that went along with a too embodied existence. There was a re reason for it, but that by about 1000 AD, the European mind, somewhat educated by that point, somewhat able to concentrate on a single point, perhaps because of a, a, a very long history of intense religious training, turned its dream to the unexplored material world and thought, well, you know, the spiritual redemption that we've been seeking didn't appear to produce the result that was promised or intended. And so maybe there's another place that we should look. And that was in the damned material world, right? Which, which was supposed to be, at least according to some elements of classic thinking, nothing but the creation of the devil. So, but the three point I'm making is that, you know, it's very difficult to underestimate the amount of human motivation that's embedded in the attempt to alleviate suffering, to eradicate yes. disease, to help people live a healthy, yes, a healthy life, and well, that's the disease, obviously, but to live a long life as well, and to make things as peaceful as possible. I mean, you can be cynical about people, and you can talk about them as motivated by power, and being corrupt, and all of those things, and all of those things are true. But you shouldn't throw away the baby with the bathwater because we have been striving for a very long time to set things right, and we've done actually not too bad a job of it for half-starving, crazy, insect-ridden chimpanzees with lifespans of 50 to 70 years. So, you know, we could deserve a bit of sympathy for our position as far as I'm concerned. So. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Some other representations. This one I like, the one on the left. That's paradise. Paradise has a walled garden, and that's what paradise means. It's paradisa, which is... I don't remember the language. It's 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's associated with Persian. Paradesa means walled garden, and why a walled garden? Well, it goes back to the chaos order idea. So this is where God puts man and woman after the creation in a walled garden. Well, the wall is culture and order, and the garden is nature. And the idea is the proper human habitat is nature and culture in balance. It's, well, we like gardens. Well, why? Because well, they're not completely covered with weeds and mosquitoes and black flies, right? So they're, they're civilized a little bit, but still within that civilization, nature in, in its more benevolent guise is encouraged to flourish and people find that rejuvenating. And so the idea that paradise, the proper habitat of a human being is a, is a walled garden is a good one. And it's walled because, well, you want to keep things out, right? I mean, raccoons, for example, you want, you want to keep those things out, man, even though it's impossible. And, you know, you don't, you don't want... Well, there's all sorts of things you don't want in your garden, like snakes. Walls don't seem to be much use against them. But the idea that paradise is a walled garden is is a, a, a an echo back to the chaos order idea. Walls, culture, right? Garden, nature. So the proper human habitat is a properly tended garden. Now, the radical left-leaning anti-theist environmentalists tend to make the case that the predations of the Western capitalist system are a consequence of the injunction that was delivered in Genesis by God to man to go out and dominate the earth. David Suzuki has talked a lot about this, by the way. They believe that that statement has given rise to our inappropriate assumption that we have the right to exert control over the world, and that that's what's turned us into these terrible predatory monsters, sometimes described as cancers on the face of the earth, or viruses that have inhabited the entire ecosystem, who are doing nothing but wandering everywhere and wreaking havoc as rapidly as we possibly can, which is another perspective on the essential element of humankind that I find absolutely deplorable. I mean, 
if you look at the historical record, for example, even casually, you'll find out that as early as, as late as the late 1800s, 1895 thereabouts, Thomas Huxley, who was Elvis Huxley's grandfather and a great defender of Darwin, prepared a report for the British government on ocean sustainability. And his conclusion was, huh, fish away, guys, man. There are so many fish out there. The oceans are so inexhaustible that no matter how hard humanity tried for, for any number of years, the probability that we could do more than put a dent in what was out there was zero. Now, Huxley turned out to be wrong. He didn't realize that our population was going to spike so dramatically, partly because we got a little bit rich and our children stopped dying at the rate of like 60% before they were one years old. And, you know, we actually managed to populate the, the, the earth with a few people, but it wasn't really until 1960 or so that we woke up to the fact that there were so many of us that we actually had to start paying attention to what we were doing to the planet. And that's like, what, 50 years ago? Well, yeah. we just started to develop the technology, the wherewithal to understand that the whole world might be well considered a garden and we need to live inside the proper balance between culture and order or culture and, and, and chaos. Before that, we were spending all of our time just trying not to die. Yeah. And usually very unsuccessfully. <laughs> so, so I don't agree with that interpretation of the opening sections of Genesis. I don't believe that it's given human beings the right to act as super predators on the planet. I think that instead the proper environment for human beings is presented quite properly as a garden and that the role of people, and that's explicitly stated in, in the second story in Adam and Eve, was to tend the garden. Yes. And that means to make the proper decisions and to make sure that everything thrives and flourishes and, and so that it's good for the things that are living there that aren't just people, but also good for the people too. So fine, I think we, there you could, go. we could at least note that that's a slightly different take on the story than the, than the ultimately cynical interpretation that's so commonly put forward today. Now inside that wall garden is a couple of trees and Adam and Eve and some animals and all of that. And unfortunately the tree happens to have a snake wrapped around it. Now that's an interesting thing. We're gonna talk about that a lot. And the snake in both of these representations says it's no ordinary snake, say it's got a human head and it's got a human head there too. So whatever that snake is, well, let forget about looking at this from a religious perspective. Like if you can, just imagine that you're an anthropologist and you've never seen this image before. It's like, what do you see? Well, you see walls and you see something, a fairly pleasant enclosure, and then you see a, a tree and people are eating from the tree, but the tree has a snake in it that has a human head. And so then you might think, well, what's a snake with a human head? And then you think, well, it's half snake and half human. That's hardly revelatory, it's just self-evident. So whatever that snake is, isn't just a snake, it's snake and human, or it's, 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 it's snake and partakes in whatever human beings are. And that's very important. So we'll, continue, we'll consider that later. And you see the same thing here. And, and you see in this particular version, there's the head. This one also has wings. And so this is a winged snake, sort of like a dragon. Ooh. And so it crawls on the ground like a reptile. And it's got an aerial aspect Bye. or a spiritual aspect. So here it's a snake, which is like the lowest form of, of reptilian life, say. Something that crawls on the ground is something that's human and something that's spiritual at the same time. And it inhabits the tree, which look a lot like magic mushrooms, by the way. And... Uh, <laughs> You can look that up if you want. That's quite an interesting little rabbit hole to wander down if you're curious about it. Um, but, but there's an idea here too, is that there was something in the garden at the beginning of time that was like a snake, that was like a person, that was like something that was winged. It was something spiritual. So it's spiritual, human, and reptilian all at the same time. And it's the animating spirit of the tree. Okay, so keep that in mind. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished. This is in relationship to Genesis 1 and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it, he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. That's wisdom in that one too, I think, the idea of the Sabbath, you know, because one of the things I've worked with a lot of people who were hyper conscientious and the thing about hyper conscientious people is that they'll just work till they die. And that's actually not very productive because then they're dead and they can't work. And so what you have to do with hyper-conscientious people is you have to say, well, I know you'd rather do nothing but work, and maybe you're just as guilty as you can possibly be when you're not working, but let's figure out what you're up to. And what you're up to, in all probability, is the attempt to be productive in the least problematic, longest sustaining possible manner. 
And that might mean you have to take the rest. Yes. And so one of the things I, I used to work with lawyers, with people who had risen to the... This is very true of self-employed people that you have to learn how to rest. You want to be constantly working at, you know, building your little small business and everything like that. And it's really, really difficult to take a day off. It is incredibly difficult to take a day off. And that's why I love this, you know, day of rest because people will just work themselves into the ground and make themselves completely useless. I, I saw my mother do it with her small business. I've done it myself with my own small businesses, with everything else. You've got to take a day to rest, a day to rejuvenate. And I love that this was included in, you know, the, the story of creation. So, all right. Yes, we got to say hello to Jason. Oh, welcome, sir. Glad you're here. Uh, Floki says the most dangerous dragons were depicted in Chinese folklore. Yes, absolutely. And there's a lot of, um, if you deal with the charismatic Christians, every time there is a holiday where they have those dancing dragons and everything like that, people come under the worst spiritual attack and they seek out the help of the Christians and stuff like that. And it is just the absolute worst time for them when they have like dragon boats and the parades and, you know, everything else. So, um, yeah, it's, it's dragons are a dangerous thing. Um, and for people to think that they are some sort of depiction of fun and, you know, Oh, this is, yeah, no dragons are dangerous. Uh, and there's a reason that they exist in every culture that's out there. So, yeah, Shaman says, Jason, good to see you. It is good to see you, Jason. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. So, um, yeah, let's continue. The top of large law firms, and they were hyperproductive types. And they're often, you know, trying to hit their impossible quota for yearly hours and, and burning themselves to a frazzle as a consequence. Yes. And one of the things that we used to do was... They couldn't work fewer hours because that a day that just didn't work. But what we did was we'd have them take more time off, you know, like a four day weekend every two months or something that was plotted out into the future. Mm -hmm. And then we track their billable hours, which is the degree of productivity. It would actually increase. So that was so cool because you could take hardworking people and you could say, look, you know, take break. Why? Well, because you'll be more productive if you take a break. No, that couldn't possibly be like, I should just work flat out all the time. It's like, let's test that out. You take a break now and then. It's like yeah. well, what happened was their productivity would increase often by 10 percent so there's a yeah. there's wisdom here too which is okay and this is alludes to the adam and eve story near the end you just you you're self-conscious you discover the future you have to work well then the question is how much should you work and one answer is you better bloody well work all the time because no matter how much work you do you're not solving your problems they're coming along man and you can stack up all the money you want. You can stack up all the wealth you want. It is not going to protect you in the final analysis. So you better be hitting the ground running and you better run flat out all the time. Well, what happens if you do that? Well, then you die. That's not a good, that's not a good solution. Yeah. So maybe you should rest. And so how does that rest get instantiated? Well, it's not easy to tell. But one way to do it, let's say conceptually, is to say, look, even God had to rest one day a week. And so... You don't have to be so presumptuous to assume that if God had to rest one day a week, that maybe, you know, you are allowed to work nonstop without a break at all. Right. You know, and, and I think our culture has slipped into that in, in quite a dangerous way because everything is open all the time. And I mean, I'm, I'm find that just as convenient as the rest of you, but you know, it's so strange to talk to modern people because one of the things they always tell you, we say, well, how are you? And they, what do they always say? They don't say good. They don't say bad. They say busy. busy. It's like, yeah, well, okay. And that's... This is where Genesis 2 starts. And that is actually a point of pride among many people is how busy they are. That I, I've seen that, especially in startups and things like that. It's, oh, I have this many meetings to go to. I have more meetings than I have time in the day. You know, da 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 It's a point of pride, and it's a point of, 
I am important and therefore I must go to this many meetings. And so people will just absolutely destroy themselves in pursuit of this. Um, so yeah, it's, it's dangerous stuff playing with fire. We are absolutely playing with fire when we do that. So here we are on to Genesis two. Let me go out there. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens and every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it grew for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth and there was not a man to till the ground, but there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Well, you know, there's some archaic thinking in there. The breath is life, right? That's psyche, that's spirit, that's inspiration, that's respiration, that's that's all associates. It's pneuma, like pneumatic tire. It's it's breath. And the reason that people associated life with breath, well, that's not so foolish, you know. I mean, you're breathing, man, and it's something you do all the time. And when you die, you stop breathing. And so the right. idea that there's something integral to life about breathing is a perfectly reasonable supposition. It actually happens to be very true. And now then to associate the act of creation with the act of, first of all, inspiration and respiration and, and the breathing of, of, of life into something that was inanimate is, is, well, what do you expect for a one sentence description? It's not a bad one sentence description, you know? Right. So, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And Eden means well-watered place. And that's particularly relevant, I suppose, if you're a desert dweller, right? Because the issue there is, can you get enough water to make things grow? Well, well-watered place. They've also figured out where the Garden of Eden supposedly is, and it's where multiple rivers come together. And so it literally was a well-watered place. And that's why so much stuff grew there, is that, you know, in this area, the the Middle East, these two rivers, the, the Tigris and the Euphrates and things like that, this is where they came together. Um, and this is before the flood, so you've got to consider that you know, the ocean was not there and a lot of the lakes and uh, were not there and things like that. So the garden of Eden being a well watered place among multiple rivers, it was very, very true. So they were, they were talking truthfully as well as talking dreamlike. And so the, the walled garden, which is paradise is also Eden, which is a well watered place. And water has the element of chaos. We already saw that in relationship to Genesis one, where, the Very underlying true. chaos was often assimilated symbolically to water. And so the idea, too, is that a certain amount of chaos has to be brought into the order in order for it to be fruitful. And you can see that in the form of, of allowing in the water. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So two trees are marked out among the rest. One is the tree of life and one is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil now you know you know when you read something like that if, if you're thinking about it that you're in a metaphorical space now we've got to be careful about metaphors because you know i could say and did that the chaos order idea is a metaphor but then i also said well wait a second it's a metaphor but it's also what your brain is adapted to and so you know let's just not be pushing the idea that it's merely a metaphor too hard and the, and the same thing is is here is happening here these are metaphors the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But that doesn't exactly mean that they're mere metaphors because sometimes, as I mentioned before, and if you have a set of things and you abstract out from them a common element, you can make a strong case that the common element is more real than the set of things from which you abstracted it. That's the whole utility of abstraction. Why would you bother with it otherwise? If you can't take a set of things and say, look, there's something in common across this set of things, it's more important than the differences between them, then you wouldn't bother abstracting at all. And so the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil are abstractions. Now, one of the questions is, this is a tough one, man. I've been trying, tried to figure out for a long time why a fruit and something you eat would be associated with the transformation of, of, of psychology, because that's basically what happens in the Adam and Eve story. Why would it be something that you eat? Now, Eric Neumann, who was one of Jung's students, had written a fair bit about this and got fair ways with it. He said, well, you know, we do have noted, we've noticed forever that the act of eating, especially if you're hungry, especially if you're starving, produces a rapid spiritual transformation, right? I mean, yes. some of you, this is worth knowing, you probably have a crabby partner or child, because everyone does, 
And one thing you might try is that if they get erratic during the day and, you know, get all volatile about nothing at all, just give them something to eat. Yes. Really, I'll tell you, man, this solves, I do this with my clinical clients all the time. It's like, they say, well, I fly off the handle at the littlest things. It's like, okay, yeah, just try this for a week. When you're crabby and unreasonable, eat a piece of cheese or eat a peanut butter sandwich. Eat something that's high protein, high fat. I mean, yes, this is where hangry comes from, where you're hungry, angry. You know, you're angry because you're hungry. So this is exactly what he's talking about right here is being hangry. And so eating, eating is something that can absolutely change everything about our physiology. Everything, everything, everything. So, yeah, this is really important. And that's why eating something, changing our physiology is, is present in Genesis. And just wait 10 minutes and see if you're sane. And you'll find out that you're sane after you eat so often that you just can't believe how crazy you are when you're hungry. Look, yeah. here's, it's really absolutely bloody remarkable. So I'm yeah. telling you, try this. It'll, 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 especially if you don't eat breakfast. This will change your life. And so here, here's a practical bit of information for you, too, for all of you um, antisocial types who are going to end up in prison. So, <laughs> if you're in prison and you want to go on parole, Okay, so you, you have to go in front of the judge and tell him why you're not going to do it again. So here's the, de here's the deal. It doesn't really matter what you did, and it doesn't really matter what you promise. What matters is whether you see the judge before lunch or after lunch. Yes. Because if you see the judge after lunch, the probability that you'll get parole is 60% higher. Yeah, 60%. right. 60%. That is just like... 60%. So never have an argument with your partner when you're hungry or when they're hungry, especially if you want something for, from them. It's like... Here's a sandwich. They'll eat it. Then they'll be happy. Then you can manipulate them. Before, before that, man, no. Genius. Genius. So, you know, it's, it's not that unreasonable to think that there's a spirit in food because food rejuvenates, and it just doesn't rejuvenate you physically. It rejuvenates you spiritually. And then, of course, there's the other things that we consume that aren't exactly like food that have a walloping spiritual impact, like alcohol, let's say, which is a spirit. And is regarded as Dionysius, right? I mean, it's the God of the Vine. And the God of the Vine possesses you and, and makes you act all the fun ways that alcohol makes you act, you know, the fun ways that you regret the next day. And uh, <laughs> so, so there's the spiritual element of that, too. And, and then, but there's something even deeper that I think is so cool that's associated with food and information. Because the, the story of Adam and Eve represents the fruit as producing a psychological transformation. And so the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is an abstraction across trees. And it's trying to say, here's something that's common across trees. It's, it's a fruit that's common across trees. It's something like that. And so the fruit across, it's common across trees is something you might call food. Fair enough, that's a generalization. But here's something that's even more cool. The food that's stable across the entire domain of food isn't food, it's information. It's information. And we use the same bloody circuits in our brain to forage for information that squirrels use to forage for food, that animals use to forage for food. It's the same circuit. And why is that? Because we figured out that knowing where things is, knowing where the food is, is more important than having the food. And so, so knowing where the food is is a form of meta-food. Information is a form of meta-food. And once you, and well, that's why we're information foragers. And so once you grasp that, and, and that idea is, is embedded into the story of Adam and Eve, so whatever it is that they ingest is a form of meta food. It's, it's, inf it's information. And, and, you know, we'll trade food for information, right? So if you're stuck on the edge of the highway and, you know, your, your hood's up and your, your going places thing is turned into a pile of junk that you don't understand and somebody pulls, beside you, pulls up beside you and they're a mechanic and they point to something and say, well, just put that wire back on there, you'll immediately give them a sandwich, right? Or you'll offer them something in return. You know what I mean? Because they've provided you with information that has value. And it has value because it actually provides you with energy. Because information provides you with energy. Because otherwise, why would we bother with it? And so food provides energy, but so does information. And so there's the, there's the idea of food that you abstract from everything you can eat. But then there's the idea of what you could abstract from all sources of food. And the answer to that would be information. And the trees that are being referred to in Adam and Eve are these meta-trees 
They're not ordinary trees, just like paradise is no ordinary place, just like Adam and Eve are no ordinary people, and just like the logos that God is using at the beginning of time is no ordinary conception. And, and these aren't, they're not metaphors, they're more than metaphors, they're, I think of them as hyper-realities, it's something like that. Is they're more real than what you see. They're more real than the reality that presents itself to you. And lots of... Now, my grandmother did this. She gave chocolate chip cookies to the guys who were building the um, seawall that would protect her house. And, and that is a huge thing. People respond to gifts of food. It is amazing how people respond to gifts of food. So let's get back to it. Things are like that, right? Numbers are like that. We wouldn't think or abstract if there weren't things that were more real than what we can see. So what's most real? Well, that's partly what we're trying to figure out. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life, also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. That's produced a tremendous amount of speculation. Now, you know, the Garden of Eden is also the holy city. That's another way of thinking about it. Or it's Jerusalem, right? Or it's the ideal state, which could be the ideal city, or it could be an ideal state of being, or it could be the ideal psyche. It's all of those things stacked up at the same time, right? And this is a Mandela, and this is the Mandela form that people, um, what we call hypothesize, that constituted the structure of paradise. You notice it's got this cross form that's Eden itself, and there's the the center of Eden, and there's the rivers. Those are rivers, not snakes. Those are the rivers that go out of it. And they're turned into these Mandela images that are representative of what Jung described as the self, which would be the center element of being that he associated, of conscious being that he associated with divinity, I would say, but also with the idea of the holy city. And so I'm just showing you that to show you what where the imagination has taken ideas of paradise. So the name of the first river is Pison, that is which compasseth the whole land of Havila, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. There's the Delium and the Onyx Stone, and the name of the second river is Gihon, the same is it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hidekel, or Hideko, I don't know. That is it which goeth towards the east of Assyria, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. Now they figured that they, they actually, there have been studies on this and I don't know who did the studies, but they talked about the various different um, uh, minerals that were there, the gold, the, the onyx, everything else. And they found it. They literally found it. And so they found where the supposed garden of Eden was, um, you know, the, the physical not just the metaphorical. And it is absolutely amazing that this happened um, and that, you know, they were able to describe these things and say, this is where it was. And it would have been the most fruitful area of all the Middle East. So yeah, this is, I mean, this is, this is both metaphorical and real guys. It's amazing. So there's this strange intermingling there of geography with mythical geography, right, which you see happen fairly frequently in the books. And the Lord God took the man Not and just put him mythical. in the Garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. Okay, so that's that's a good that's a good command. That's what you're supposed to do is take care of the damn thing. Yep. It's a lot of work to make, right? Took a whole week. <laughs> <laughs> and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, "Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it." For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Well, there's a bunch of questions there that people have been puzzling or puzzling over for a long time. God, he, he's a tricky character in, in the story of Adam and Eve. It's like, oh, okay, if we can't eat the damn thing, well, why put it in the garden to begin with? That would be one question. And uh, you made us, and then you told us not to eat this, knowing perfectly well that the first thing we were going to do is eat it, because people are of exactly that. Type, which is that if you say to them with their insatiable, insatiable curiosity, this is all fine and nice, but over here is something you should never look at, and then you leave the room, it's like everybody's over there trying to figure out what the hell that thing is right. instantly, right? Because right. we're curious, 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 curious creatures. And so you have to wonder exactly what God was up to here. There's Gnostic speculation that the original God, this one, was not really a very good God. He was kind of an unconscious evil God, and that 
wanted his creation to be unconscious and so forbade them from developing consciousness and that it was a higher god who and maybe in the form of the serpent who tempted human beings towards consciousness and you know that that idea got scrubbed out of plastic christianity pretty early although there's something that's interesting about it and there are remnants of it in different forms that stayed inside the story um like the idea that the fall was you know a terrible t tragedy but at, on the other hand it was the precondition for the greatest event in history which was the birth of christ and the redemption of mankind and so it's complicated let's put it that way this is a good example of that ambivalence and to me again that it, it's an indication of the sophistication of the people who put these stories together i also consider this somewhat miraculous because you know if you were just a simple propagandist of sorts you wouldn't leave this sort of complexity in the text you just get rid of that because if you're a propagandist, everything is supposed to make sense along the ideological plane. Here, God's supposed to be good. It's like, well, we better get there to that line because something's up with it and it isn't obvious what it is. But that isn't what people did. And to me, that indicates that, that they were doing two things, is they were trying not to be too careless with the traditions that they were handed. They, they, were, they were touching them at their peril. They were very careful with them. And also yes. that they were actually trying to understand what was going on because... Why otherwise keep this? Why not just simplify it? Or maybe just attribute this to the devil. That would be easier than yep. having God do it. Yeah. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make a help me for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all the cattle and the fowl of cattle means animals, basically, and to the fowl of the air. And to every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not found a help meet for him. Okay, well, a couple of things there, speculations. Number one, it's like, why does God care what Adam calls the animals? And the answer to that seems to be that it's associated again with the magic of speech, right? So that we know, according to the story, that human beings were already made in the image of God and that God used language in order to call order forth from chaos and that human beings were made in that image. And so there's an echo of that here, even though it's from an independent tradition. And the echo is the thing isn't quite real till you name it. Yes. And that's quite and that that's an interesting thing. And we don't exactly know how far that extends. It's certainly the case that it extends to everything. But seeing things often exist in a strange potential form, interconnected form, where everything's confusing, like a mass of confusion. Yep. Before you put your finger on it, name it. Yep. What's going on here? You name it. It's like it it's it, carves it out from all that underlying chaos and makes it into a grippable entity that you can then contend with. And you might say, well, it was real before you named it. It's like, well, yes, it was real before you named it the same way things are there when there's no one there to perceive them. And it isn't obvious how things are there when you're not there to perceive them. I'll tell you something bloody weird about perception. You can look this up with John Wheeler. John Wheeler is a physicist. So here's a really cool thing. Let's say you go outside at night and you look up and you see a star. And like, so a photon from that star enters your eye. And maybe that photon has been cruising along for like 30 million years. Do you know that that photon would not have been emitted from that star at that time if your eye wasn't there at that time to receive it? You think, well, how in the hell can that be? Because it happened 20 million years ago. It's like, well, I don't know how it can be, to tell you the truth. But I know that John Wheeler has done a very good job of detailing out why that's true and necessarily true. And so and Wheeler is also the this physicist who developed amazing. the notion of it from bit. And he believes yes. that the world is best construed as a, the potential of the world is best construed as a place of information. It's something like latent information. And that what consciousness does is transform the latent information information into something like concrete reality. And he doesn't mean that metaphorically. And one of the cases that he makes in that regard is this story that I just told you, is that the photon couldn't have leapt from where it was unless it had a place to go. Now, it's it's complicated and confusing because from the perspective of a, of a beam of light, from a photon, there is no time and there's no distance from one point to another. And of course, that's completely impossible to understand too. But from the perspective of a photon, the universe is completely flat, perpendicular to the direction that the photon is traveling. So it's there and here at the same time. For us, it's not. It's like 20 million years ago, but for the photon, it's, it's all here and now. So 
Anyways, the reason I'm telling you all that is because the relationship between consciousness and reality is by no means straightforward. It is seriously not straightforward. And physicists, physicists debate what the relationship is between consciousness and reality, and they debate about what the sort of phenomena that I just described mean. And I'm not really qualified to enter into that debate because I'm not a physicist, but I do know, and I've read a fair bit of Wheeler, as about as much of it as I can understand, and I do at least know that that's what he claimed. And I also know that that claim is, is not, that's a claim that's taken seriously among physicists of the caliber of the physicists who can understand Wheeler. So that's pretty interesting. So anyways, there is emphasis again on this importance of naming in order to make things real. You know, and sometimes people won't name things just so they don't become real. Yes. So, you know, if, yes. if, you're, if yes. you have a relationship, which undoubtedly you do, and it has problems, which undoubtedly it does, you bloody well know that lots of times there's something under the carpet that no one wants to name and everybody's thinking well as long as we don't know it, it's not really there the and in some in sense our... it really isn't there because you can act as if it's not there and get away with it at least for short periods of time but as soon as you name that thing it's like you give it form and it's there and no one can ignore it and that's annoying because then you have to deal with it or or that's the elephant in the room the thing that nobody wants to talk about that thing that's sitting in the corner it's taking up so much space the thing that everybody's walking around, the thing that, that, that is just, you know, it's there, but you can't deal with it. The elephant. Oh, oh my gosh. I've got migraine yawns. I am so sorry. The elephant in the room, the thing that nobody wants to name. And when you name it, if you're the person who names it, oh my gosh, woe be unto you because everybody's going to jump on you for naming it. Oh, it's alcoholism. Ah! Oh, it's it's drug addiction. Ah! Oh, it's somebody's chronic illness. Ah! You know, the elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about that is screwing everybody up. That that you name it at your peril. But once you name it, you can deal with it. But people don't want to deal with stuff. They just want to go on like they always have. And so, yeah, it's it's really, really difficult to deal with the elephant in the room. And that's what he's talking about right here. Or, or face the consequences. But the reason I'm telling you that is because we have a an intuition even that we can have things not exist by not naming them. You yeah. name it and it comes forward with staggering clarity. And it's not as if naming it is the only thing that gives it reality, but it is something like it sharpens it and brings it into focus and gives it borders and barriers, borders and boundaries. It makes it so, unignorable. Anyways, God's interested enough in what Adam has to say that he has him name all the animals, and that oh. sort of makes them into animals. Now, there's more to the linguistic story than that. So the social psychologist Roger Brown was one of them, studied this really interesting phenomena, which is associated with... Uh, relationship between perception and action. You know how a kid will call a particular animal a cat? Well, the word cat is very short, like the word dog. And it turns out that, you know, you could think that we could perceive cats as multicellular organisms. Like we could see the cells, we could see the molecules, we could see the atoms, we could see, or we could see the ecosystem that the cat is part of. But we don't, or, or maybe the the broader mammalian classification that it's part of. We could perceive that as the unit of perception, but we don't. We perceive things at the level of cat, and you can tell the perceptual level that people naturally perceive that doesn't seem to be socioculturally determined to any great degree, by the way, because the words are often short and easily remembered and early learned. And so there's this level of analysis. Out of all the possible levels of analysis that the world does exist at, we perceive it at a certain level of analysis, and that level of analysis seems to have something to do with the world's functional utility for us at that level. And the perception at that level and the naming at that level gives things a reality at that level. You know, because the thing about things is that they're not easily separable from other things. They tangle together in all sorts of strange ways. And yet when we cast our eye and, and, and use our language to orient ourselves in the world, we cut things up into discrete, discriminable objects that we can then utilize. And there's something about that that makes them real in a way that their interconnected potential, the interconnected potential that they were before that, 
that it's not it's not real in the same way at least i think it's even less real i think that's the right way of thinking about it even though it's not completely unreal but it's an echo adam's a little god at that point a little god the father and god's already done the groundwork but adam has to come along and says say well that's a cat it's like poof whatever that is is now a cat and that's a dog and that's a sheep and you know it, it, it gives them it gives them something like pragmatic form for Adam, there was not found a help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And, he, and God took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. That's a walloping statement to put in there at the end of those three sentences. <laughs> and the therefore comes as somewhat of a surprise, but there's an injunction there. Well, it's a good injunction, man. You, I'll tell you, people who don't do that, they have a hell of a time in their marriage. And so this is a good thing to know. If you are married or if you're planning to get married, it's like, you know, we have very strong orientation towards our parents and for good reason. It's like the injunction here is that secondary since you're married. Yep. And, and failure to do that makes your marriage collapse. Yep. And then you deserve it to collapse too, as far as I'm concerned, because it's a reflection of your pathological immaturity and your unwillingness to extract yourself from the, you know, Kellen-like grip of parents who are a little bit too much on the interfering side. But the injunction, there's, there's a deep injunction here. It's very complicated. So one of the ideas is that the original Adam wasn't a man, like, like a separate man. It was more like a hermaphroditic being. And in that hermaphroditic being, there was a kind of per undifferentiated perfection. And then that was split into male and female. And then that part of the goal of human beings is to reunite that as the singular unity that reestablishes the initial perfection. And that's actually the goal of marriage from a spiritual perspective. You could read about that if you read Jung, because he wrote quite a bit about that. It's lovely. It's such a good idea. So I had these friends that went to Sweden to get married. They were northern. They were from northern Alberta, but his heritage. They're both their heritage for Swedish, Swedish. And in this ceremony, they did this cool thing as they, they were being married. And they had to hold a candle up between them, right? While they were being married, and you think, well, okay, that's the candle. No, it's a source of light, a source of illumination, right? Sorry, guys, the, the dogs are going nuts. I'll be right back. <laughs> source of enlightenment. It's the candle that you put on Christmas trees in, in Europe. So it's the light that emerges in the darkness in the depth of winter. It's a symbol of life in, in, in darkness. It's the reemergence of the sun at the, at the darkest, coldest time of the year, which is also associated symbolically with the, re, with the birth of Christ for all sorts of complicated reasons. And so the candle is all that. And then the next question is, why do you hold it above you? And the answer is because what's above you is what you're below to. So it simplifies something transcendent. So why do you both hold on to it? Well, because you're both supposed to hold on to the light, right? And you're supposed to be subordinate to the light. And so you ask, well, who's in charge in marriage? Well, the light. That's the idea. So you come together as one thing. You're no longer two things. It isn't what's good for you, and it's not what's good for your wife. It's what's good for the marriage. And the marriage is about the combined being, which is the reassembly of the original perma. perma Prodetic, hermaphroditic being at the beginning of time. That's the idea. And that's all packed into like these four sentences. And you know, there's been, well, all of these sentences have tremendous history of interpretation associated with them, right? It's just yes. endless and endless and endless. And that's one of the lines. And so it's also an antidote to the idea that women taken out of men, which is obviously the reverse of the biological process, by the way makes women in some sense subordinate to men. That is not built into this text. I don't see that at, at all as no. built into the text. And there's something else that's associated with it too. And there's an idea that, um, you know, in, in, in Sleeping Beauty, you know, Sleeping Beauty goes to sleep. And the reason she goes to sleep is because you, you have to remember what happens is she has parents who are quite old. And so they're pretty desperate to have a child, like so many people are now. And they only have one child, like so many people do now. And they, they don't want anything to happen to this child. Because like, hey, it's a miracle. And there's only one of them. And so and she's the princess. And so it's like, we're not letting anything around her. So they have a big christening party, right? And they invite everybody. 
but they don't invite Maleficent. And Maleficent is the terrible mother. She's nature. She's like the thing that goes bump in the night. She's the devil herself, so to speak. She's everything that you don't want your child to encounter. So the king and queen say, well, we just want to invite her to the christening. It's like, good luck with that. That's an Oedipal story. Sam. Right? The Oedipal mother is the mother who devours her child by refusing, by overprotecting him or her, so that instead of being strengthened by an encounter with the terrible world, they're weakened by too much protection, and then when they're let out into the world, they cannot live. And that's the story of Sleeping Beauty, and that's what the king and queen do. And they apologize to the to Maleficent when she first shows up and say, well, you know, they have a bunch of half-witted excuses why they don't invite her. We forgot. It's like, I don't think so. You know, you don't forget something like that. And she kind of makes that point. It's right, the whole horror of life. You don't forget about that when you have a child, that's for sure. You might wish that it would stay at bay, but you do not forget about it. The question is, do you invite it to the party? And the answer is, it bloody well depends how unconscious you want your child to be. Yeah. And if you want your child to be unconscious, well, then you have the added advantage that maybe they won't leave home. And so you can take advantage of them for the rest of your sad life instead of going off to find something to do for yourself. The basement dwellers. That's the basement dwellers with the snowplow parents. The ones who cleared everything out of their way. Give them participation trophies, things like that. That's exactly what this is. Well, and then, of course, you can take revenge on them if they do have any, any what would you call, impetus towards courage that you sacrificed yourself 30 years ago and want to stamp out as soon as you see it develop in your child. That's another thing that would be quite pleasant. And so that's what happens in Sleeping Beauty. Yeah, well, none of this is pleasant, and nothing that happens in that story is pleasant. Nope. So Sleeping Beauty, she's naive as hell. They put her out in the forest and have her raised by these three, like, goody-two-shoes fairies that are also completely <laughs> devoid of any real potency and power, right? There's no nothing Maleficent about them. And then the first idiot prince that wanders by, she falls in love with so badly that she has post-traumatic stress disorder when he rides off on his horse, right? That's what happens. Yeah. And then she, then she goes into the castle and she's all freaked out because she met the love of her life for like five minutes, for God's sake. And, you know, that's when the spinning wheel, that's the wheel of fate, pops up and she pricks her finger, right? They try to get rid of all the spinning wheels. They try to get rid of all the wheels of fate with their pointed end. But she finds it, poke, pricks her fingers, and finger falls down unconscious. Well, she wants to be unconscious. And no bloody wonder. She was protected her whole life. She's so damn naive that her first love affair just about kills her. She wants yep. to go to sleep and never wake up. Yep. So that's exactly what happens. And then she has to wait for the prince to come and rescue her. Well, you think, how sexist can you get that story? Well, seriously, because that's... That's the way that that would be read in, in, in the modern world. It's like she doesn't need a prince to rescue her. That's why Disney made Frozen that absolutely appalling piece of rubbish. <laughs> yes! So, you know, you can say, you can say, well, the princess doesn't need a prince to rescue her, but, you know, that's a boneheaded way of looking at the story because... The prince isn't just a man who's coming to rescue the woman. And believe me, he's got his own problems, right? He's got a whole goddamn dragon he has to contend with. But, but the prince also represents the woman's own consciousness. The consciousness is yes. presented very frequently in stories as symbolically masculine, as it is with the Logos idea. And the idea is that without, without that forward-going, courageous consciousness, a woman herself will drift into unconsciousness and terror. And so you can read it as, well, the woman who's sleeping needs a man to wake her up and of course just like a man needs a woman to wake him up it's the same damn thing that's the dragon fight in sleeping beauty but it's also the case that if she's only unconscious all she can do is lay there and sleep like the, the sleep of the naive and damn she has to wake and wake herself up and, and 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 bring her own consciousness her own masculine consciousness into the forefront so that she can survive in the world yes and of course women are trying to do that like mad but that's partly what's represented in the story like that and that's partly what's implicit in this idea is that unless the woman is taken out of man, so to speak, then she isn't a human being. She's just a creature. And that's partly what's embedded in this story. So you don't want to read it as a patriarchal. You don't want to read anything that way. So really, it's it really it's yeah, I won't I won't bother with that. But really, we can do better than that. Pat. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. It's like, yeah. Thing, the other thing about marriage, this is really worth knowing too, is that you know, I, I learned this in part from reading Jung. It's like, what do you do when you get married? That's easy. 
you take someone who's just as useless and horrible as you are, and then you shackle yourself to them. There you go. And then you say, we're not running away. Yep. No matter what happens. Yep. Yeah, well, that, that's perfect because then you don't get to run away. And the thing is, it's like, if you can run away, you can't tell each other the truth. Right. Because if you tell someone the truth about you and they don't run away, they weren't listening. And so <laughs> if you don't have someone around that can't run away, then you can't tell them the truth. And so that's part of the purpose of the marriage. It's like, okay, okay. I'll bet on you. You bet on me. It's a losing bet. We both know that. But <laughs> given our current circumstances, we're unlikely to find anyone better. That's for sure. You know what? God, he nails two things it. that come off of that. One is, you know, people are waiting around to find Mr. or Mrs. Right. It's like, here's something to think about, man, to put yourself on your feet right. If you went to a party and you found Mr. Right and he looked at you and didn't run away screaming, that would indicate that he wasn't Mr. Right at all. Yep. Right? It's like the old Nietzschean joke. Uh, if someone loves you, that should immediately disenchant you with them. Yes. <laughs> right, right. Or it's the Woody Allen joke. I never belonged to a club that would take me as a member. That's so, so that's a that's an interesting. That's a very interesting thing to think about. And so you're going. To uh, uh, that's 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 not Woody Allen. That's um. Uh. What's his name? Marks with the with the mustache. Um, oh God, I can't remember his first name now. If anybody can remember his first name, you know, it, it's not Karl Marx. It's the other Marx. It's the, the comedian Marx. Um, and what was funny is, is he was a womanizer and he used to cheat on his wife all the time. But she said the second that she saw him, her heart just went into flutters, you know, the doki doki that the, the Japanese talk about. And she didn't care that he was a womanizer because that was the kind of effect that he had on her. And so, yeah, um, that, that, that's not, that's not Woody Allen, that's Marx. So um, the, the big glasses, big mustache, Marx. Can't remember his name for the life of me now, but anyway. To shackle yourself to someone who's just as, imp as imperfect as you are. And then the issue is, you, you, you might be in a situation where you can actually negotiate because you might think, well, there's some things about you that aren't going so right. And there's some things about me that aren't going so right. And we're bloody well stuck with the consequences for the next 50 years. So we can at least straighten this out or we can suffer through it for the next five decades. And, you know, people are of the sort that without that degree of seriousness, those problems will not be solved. Yep. You'll leave things unnamed because there's always an out. It's like, and it's the same thing when you're living together with someone. You know that people who live together before they're married are more likely to get divorced, not less likely. And the reason for that is, what exactly are you saying to one another when you live with each other? Just think about it. Well, for now, <laughs> you're better than anything else I can trick. <laughs> but I'd like to reserve the right to trade you in. <laughs> Conveniently, if someone better happens to stumble into me. Ah, oh, so true. So true of my marriage. Well, how can, how can someone not be insulted to their core by an offer like that? Now, they're willing to play along with it because they're going to do the same thing with you. Now, well, that's exactly it. It's like, yeah, yeah, I know you're not going to commit to me, so that means you don't value me or our relationship above everything else. But as long as I get to escape if I need to, then I'm willing to put up with that. It's like... That's a hell of a thing. I mean, you might think, how stupid is it to shackle yourself to someone? It's like, it's stupid, man. There's no doubt about that. It's but more compared stupid. to the alternatives, yeah. it's pretty damn good. Because yeah. without that shackling, there are things you will never, ever learn. Because you'll avoid them. You yeah. can always leave. And if yeah. you can leave, then you don't have to tell each other the truth. It's as simple as that, because you can just leave. And then you don't have anyone you can tell the truth to. That is so true. So true. And I learned it. My, and I grew up with that stupid idea that you move in and you, you know, live in sin, so to speak. And that that's the healthier way to create a relationship and a marriage. No, no. The test driving. No, it's BS. It is total BS. And he is absolutely spot on with this. 
absolutely spot on with this. And oh my gosh, we we have an entire generation, Generation X, that was raised on that crap. And we were absolutely, I mean, hell, you can go back to my parents' generation. Absolute crap. Absolute crap. And uh, we have destroyed so many families, so many children with this idea. Unbelievable. Unbelievable what we have done. Ourselves. And this is, this is wisdom that's over 2,000 years old. And we just kind of chucked it out the window. You know, that was the baby we lost with the bathwater. Ah, ah, uh, yeah. So if you're living with your boyfriend, if you're living with your girlfriend, realize that the, the, the success of your relationship is cut by 60%, 60%. Okay. You want to run those odds? Really? You want to run those odds? No, no. Do it right. Do it right from the beginning. No divorce. There is no running away from you. There is no running away from me. We stick this out. That is what you're looking for. That is the ultimate relationship. Is that no matter what horrid thing I find out about you, we will stay together. I don't care what it is. You murdered somebody? Okay, I will stick by your side. And this is repeated. This is repeated in all sorts of different cultures. I will stick by your side, no matter what monster you, you turn out to be. That is commitment. That is the kind of thing that you want from a marriage. That, I mean, we we said it. Westerns, Clint Eastwood did this. I, we're, we're talking about the Icelandic myths. Talked about this. You know, th this has been repeated time and time and time again. And uh, I wish, I w my my parents' generation was so screwed up because you could just divorce and leave. You know, Virginia Woolf, such crap, such crap. Uh, it, uh, we need to get back to the foundations. We need to get back to this idea that we do not divorce. You know, we do not divorce. Unbelievable, unbelievable that, that we allowed this stuff to creep in. And, and it was a cultural thing. It wasn't a realistic thing. It was a cultural thing, you know, it just oof. so anyway, let's get back to it. So there's some representations of the idea of the original. It's not, this isn't all Adam. This is, this is an old Chinese symbol. I think it's Faxiannua, although I think I have the pronunciation wrong, but it's really cool. See, it's, see the snakes down here? They're kind of like a DNA symbol, which I find very interesting. And so that's the original cosmic serpent. That's sort of the potential out of which that emerges. And then that's the differentiation of that into male and female. And so that's like the predatory unknown that's one way of thinking about it. That's the most fundamental conception of mankind is something like that is the predatory unknown. And then the bifurcation of that into the two fundamental cognitive elements of human perception, masculine and female. And you see the same thing here. This is Chinese. This is Egyptian, also extraordinarily old. It's the, it's the great serpent that underlies everything, uh, uh, bifurcating itself into Isis, queen of the underworld, and Osiris, king of, the, king of, king of king, pharaoh, king of order. You see the same thing in an old alchemical symbol. I love this one. Does it looks quite a lot like the little thing that Harry Potter chases around, eh? Yeah, and that's not accidental, by the way, because the seeker is the thing, the thing that chases this, and the seeker that chases this and catches it wins. And that's a really old idea, and how the hell J.K. Rowling knew that, I cannot figure out, because that is a very, very archaic symbol, arcane symbol. On Google, it's called the Round Chaos, and the only ref reference to the Round Chaos that I can find on Google is on my webpage. 
And so ha <laughs> ha. I have no idea how, how Rowling came up with that. I mean, I know she looked at a lot of old texts, but the idea that if you play the metagame and you catch this, you win all the games is exactly right. And, that, and that's the motif for, what's the name of that? Quidditch. Quidditch. Yeah. So there's the potential. That's like the potential out of which God made the world at the beginning of time. And what emerges out of that is some kind of, that's a dragon, you know, the, the, in the dragon fight. That's partly the serpent that's in the Garden of Eden. And then that's the manifestation of masculine and feminine out of that. Potential, predatory, unknown, masculine and feminine. It's like a single, it's like a single representation of the evolutionary history of human cognitive consciousness. So cool. Yeah. And that's also an image of the ideal. It's the union of sun and moon. And it's this hyper creature, hermaphroditic, it's also the Adam and Eve that existed at the beginning of time before the fall. And it's the purpose of marriage. Yeah. All of that as a sacrament, all of that in these images, it's just absolutely unbelievable what images can pack into them. And there's some more classical representations of, of Eve being extracted from Adam. Um, and this is a cool line. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Well, that see, someone who wrote that would only write that like that if they were surprised that they weren't ashamed, because why would you point it out otherwise? And so there's this intimation that of two things. Number one is there was a point at time in time when human beings were naked and they weren't ashamed of it. And there is a point of time, which is now where they're naked and they are ashamed of it. And then the question is, well, what's the association with nakedness and shame? And that's also often given a sexual connotation in, in classic interpretations of the Adam and Eve story because of its association with, with nudity, I presume. But I think it's a lot more complicated than that. So you think, and I noticed my daughter. The naked truth. She probably won't be very happy that I'm revealing this in this lecture. But my daughter was never really concerned about nudity when she was a little kid. It was all the same to her one way or another. But my son, by the time he was three, man, that kid was private. He, his, his bedroom door was shut. The bathroom door was shut. It was like, get the hell out of here. And that seemed to just happen of its own accord. And, you know, we had two children and one was like that and the other one wasn't. I didn't think we had much to do with it at all. But it was really fascinating to watch that emerge in him. And, you know, that, that sense of, of self-consciousness does seem to emerge in children somewhere around the age of three. And, you know, that's generally also when we start thinking that maybe having your baby wander around naked on a beach isn't exactly the best idea. There's, there's, there's something like that. It's the nudity in children is generally okay under some circumstances in public display. We, we seem to think of that as merely uh, it's acceptable natural why i don't know why it stops being acceptable well that has something to do with sexuality obviously yes. but it's a very complicated phenomena but you know the whole nudity thing is the, it's a very complicated thing i mean first of all people are kind of strange because we're hairless roughly you know compared to most animals and we don't know why that is some people think it's because we lost our hair when we were wandering around in the de in the desert running around in africa because Maybe. we're really really good runners we can run down animals say. yes like a, a, a human being in good shape can run a horse to death in a week yeah we can really run man and, and, and a lot of our ancestors the kelly harry bushmen still do this they just run an animal for like it, till it dies and the, and the, and the reason for this is that we can sweat over our entire body most animals can only sweat from their mouths and their paws, if they have paws. That's the thing about running down a horse. That's the thing about, you know, I mean, you know, horses sweat from all over their body. But human beings, the way that we sweat is so efficient and so good. We, we are the zombies of the natural world. You know, it's like these things run away from us and we just keep coming and we just keep coming and we just keep coming. We are the nightmare of other animals, you know, because we can exhaust them and it's that easy. It is that easy. And yeah, we, we will kill an animal just by chasing it down. Um, so yeah, it's, it's phenomenal. And that Bushman doesn't die. I mean, they also sometimes shoot them with poison arrows, but they can just run them until they die. Mm -hmm. So we have tremendous endurance, and you and you have to be able to get rid of a lot of heat if you're going to run around in the desert. So we don't have much hair. That's one explanation. And, and we, but and we sweat. Fuller had an interesting explanation, which was he thinks that at some point during our evolution, we spend a lot of time near the water, and so we're like fish apes, something like that. Well, you know, we like to be on the beach, and there's lots of food there, and we like to swim, and we're really good at swimming for terrestrial creatures. 
And uh, we, we cry salt tears like some sea going creatures do. And women have a layer of subcutaneous fat like some sea going creatures do. And we have kind of our feet, are, which are very odd things, are kind of good for flapping in the water, although we can also walk with them. And so he thought that maybe that adaptation was to, to a, a water existence like seals and so forth. Like we kind of went back to the ocean, but not quite. And so, but anyways, the evolution of that hairlessness is an interesting thing. But it certainly does make us exposed to the world in a way that animals that have a covering of fur aren't. And then we're upright, which is very strange because most animals aren't. They're on all fours, and so their very vulnerable parts are protected and, and not exposed to view. And then, of course, when you're standing up nude, you're, you're, you're phys let's call it your psychophysiological quality is on painful display, right? And people complain about that all the time, you know, if you... Look at the feminist tack, for example, on beauty. The idea that women have eating disorders is, is directly um, attributed to the presence of too many beautiful women on the cover of magazines, something like that. Even though women buy those magazines and they're attracted to them and their mood goes up when they purchase them. And if the, if the stimulus was uh, negative, the women would avoid the magazines and not buy them. So as a theory, it's a very, very bad one. Yeah. But it's still the case that, you know, it's still the case that Standards of beauty shame people, and that's for sure, and everyone, because if you're not ugly now, man, you're going to be at some point in your life. <laughs> so that's kind of a rough thing to contend with, right? It's, it's a rough thing to, to know that, that there's an ideal that you could be, and maybe even once were, that you're not going to be for long or, ne or, or never were. And yeah. it's really an appalling issue, because I think it's harder on women, because women are judged by men more for their, but for their youth. And women are vain. Let's be honest, ladies. Let's be flipping honest here. We are vain creatures. I put on makeup. Why? I'm not competing with men. You know, I, I don't care what a man looks like. A man could have a pot belly. He could be overweight. He could, you know, all sorts of things could be wrong with him. If he makes enough money, who cares, right? Women are vain creatures. We are competing with other women. Why? Because that's our hierarchy. You know, if we can climb up that hierarchy and we can be that, you know, playboy model, we can have any man we want. That's why we are vain creatures. And we always will be vain creatures. I mean, I'm 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 40 what? And I'm still trying to put on makeup and I'm still, you know, worried about my weight and everything else like this. We are vain creatures. Men are not vain, like unless they're gay. Unless they have, you know, like really high estrogen levels. Men are not vain like that. You know, men are more concerned with they've got that badass car. They've got that badass job. They've got that badass house. You know, they, it's what you can accumulate as a man, you know, that gives you prowess. Your, your, your power as a man gives you prowess. You know, your beauty as a woman gives you prowess. Why? Because that's what attracts the attention of the man. But we compete among our own sex. And Jordan Peterson talks about this stuff. And so, yeah, it makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. And, and fertility, that's how it turns out from the evolutionary point of view. Men are judged more on their socioeconomic status by women. It's harsh both ways. But yep. So anyways, it's, you know, it's a terrible thing to, to carry the knowledge with you that you're exposed to the most serious possible evaluation of the quality of your being that you can possibly be exposed to all the time. Yep. And that that's further amplified if you're without clothing. And so yes. part of that is protection, but a tremendous amount of it is merely stopping other people from evaluating you too harshly all the time. It just gets in the way. Yep. So anyways, this story, this, this story makes the case that at some point, we weren't like that. Well, animals aren't like that, so it seems perfectly plausible that at some point we weren't like that, but at some point that changed. And, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. 
Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. I like this. This is, um, oh, I can't remember who did the etching now. Who is it? Doré, yeah, Doré, exactly. He, 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 Doré did etchings for Paradise Lost that are absolutely remarkable. This is Satan and this is the snake here. And of course, in, in, in the Genesis story, Satan is weirdly associated with the snake. And I'll tell you, that's a, that's a, that's a tough one to sort out because in the story of Adam and Eve, there's no indication whatsoever that the serpent who tempts Eve is also Satan, the author of all evil. And how in the world those two stories got tangled together? Well, I think I figured that out, and I'm going to tell you that tonight, but it took a very long time to figure it out, and it's wow. absolutely it's so bloody brilliant. I just can't believe that people figured it out. It's so, it's so unbelievably, spectacularly brilliant. And that's, a, that's a, an intimation of that idea, right, that there's a kinship between these two things. So anyways, the serpent's more subtle than any beast of the field. Subtle's an interesting word. This is from the Oxford English Dictionary, So, because we'll amplify the word a bit. This is what you do in Jungian dream interpretation, for example, is to kind of look at the connotations of the concepts that are associated with the dream. Subtle, of a person or animal, an action, behavior, crafty, cunning, sly, treacherous. So it's something that sort of sneaks along, right? It's not something that you really pick up on that easily. Of a look or glance, sly, furtive, surreptitious. Of a person, skillful, expert, clever. Of a work of art, mechanical device, cleverly made or designed, ingenious. Well, that, that's, I think that's all fairly, uh, all those terms so far are fairly well attributed to snakes. I mean, they are very cool things and, and they are very well designed and they're quite remarkable and they're also very subtle. Um, on the nature of or involving careful discrimination of, of fine points or fine points difficult to understand and abstruse. Of a person, the mind. Or intellectual activity. Intellectual activity characterized by wisdom or perceptiveness, discriminating, discerning, and truth. That's interesting because Milton's Satan is also the intellect. And, you know, you see that very often. You know, it's so often the bad guy's an evil scientist, right? And there's something about, and you see the same thing in The Lion King with Scar. I mean, Scar is an intellect, an arrogant, deceitful intellect. He's, there's nothing stupid about Scar. He's not wise, but he's the, he's the evil voice that's always whispering in the king's ear. And that's associated with the pride of the intellect. And the Catholics have warned, warned humanity about the pride of the intellect for centuries. That's partly what produced somewhat of the schism between Catholicism and science, although that's much overstated if you look at the historical record. The idea was that the intellect has its own particular, it's a remarkable faculty. Let's say it's the highest angel in God's heavenly kingdom. That's the way that Milton portrayed it. But it's also the thing that can go most terribly wrong because intellect the intellect can become arrogant about its own existence and accomplishments, and it can fall in love with its own products. And that's what happens yes. when you're ideologically possessed, because you end up with a dogma, like say a human constructed dogma in Solzhenitsyn's words, that possesses you completely, of which you believe is 100% right, right? So it eradicates the necessity for anything transcendent. And so that's the subtle element of the intellect that's associated symbolically with the snake in the garden of paradise. Of a feeling, sense, sensation, acute and keen, involving distinctions that are fine or delicate, especially to such an extent as to be difficult to discern or analyze, also almost imperceptible and elusive, having little thickness or breadth, thin, fine, subtil matter, now historical, rarefied matter, barely there at all. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has, God has said, you shall not eat of it, Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Sneaky, subtle. It's a nice story, eh? The first thing is, the for instant, the instant implication is, well, you can't trust God. Well, the other thing about this is if they had eaten the trees in the reverse order, they would have been gained immortality, not been kicked out of the garden of evil, then gain knowledge of good and evil, then be immortal and have the knowledge of good and evil. So the snake is doubly, doubly, you know, just, uh, just 
sinister here. You know, because if you'd eaten the trees in the reverse order, it would have been a much different game. But no, the snake doesn't want them to have the power of gods. The snake just wants them to know the difference between good and evil. And they get kicked out because of that. But if we had been immortal and had the knowledge, I mean, there were two trees. There were two trees. Which one did the snake say eat from first? Yeah. That's something to think about. So that's pretty sneaky. And the next is, well, he's trying to he's trying to pull a fast one on you. And the next one is, well, he's trying to do that because he's jealous and he, he doesn't want you to know things that he knows because that wouldn't be so good. And he's lying to you anyways because you're not going to die. And if you eat it, contrary to what you've been informed, then all that's going to happen is your eyes will be open and you'll be like gods knowing good and evil. That sounds pretty damn good. So, you know, and I, I mean, Eve. Be like you know, God. You know, it's no wonder she's susceptible to such blandishments. And it's quite interesting, too, because Adam and Eve, God tells Adam and Eve not to eat the damn fruit, but they never promise not to. Right? So they haven't promised. They've just been told to. And, well, should they be obedient? Well, how obedient do you want your children to be? You want them to be obedient enough so they don't get hurt, but disobedient enough so that they go out in the world and do something courageous and they break some rules and they learn some things. And, so, you know, it's 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 a very paradoxical story. Yeah. Anyways, the serpent wins, wins this round, man. And so Eve pays attention to the snake. So, again, we have the same set of images, right? We have Adam and we have Eve. We have this tree and we have this strange serpent. That's a dragon-like form. There are sphinx-like form that's associated with the tree. The snake's eternally associated with the tree. Well, the snake was eternally associated with the tree. He spent God only knows how many tens of millions of years as tree-dwelling primates. And the primary or one of our primary predators, we had three primary predators, snakes, birds, cats. And so the snake has been associated with the tree for a very, very long time. And the lesson the snake tells people is, you bloody well better wake up or something you don't like will get you. And who's going to be more susceptible, most susceptible to paying attention to the snake? And that's going to be Eve. And the reason for that is Eve has offspring. And there's nothing yeah. tastier to a snake than a child. And so Eve had every reason to be self-conscious and neurotic. And women are more self-conscious and neurotic than men by quite a substantial amount. And that's true cross-culturally. And it emerges at puberty. And part of the reason is, as far as we can tell, is that women are more sexually vulnerable. They're also smaller. So that's a problem if you're engaged in any physical alteration. But most importantly, I think, is that why would you ever assume that a human female's nervous system is adapted to her or her well-being? Why wouldn't you assume instead that her nervous system is adapted to the female infant dyad? Because if it isn't, then the infants die. There you so go. you might think, well, women are way more susceptible to depression and anxiety than men are. And that's a hell of a burden to bear. And that's also true cross-culturally, by the way. And it also kicks in at puberty. And the biggest differences are in Scandinavia, for those of you who think it's sociocultural, which it isn't. So, but there's reasons for it, you know. And it's also at puberty when men and, men and women start to become sexually dimorphic in terms of size. And men are way more powerful in their upper bodies. It's in, yes. incomparably more powerful. And so that makes them a lot more dangerous. And human, the human primary human defense mechanism is punching, like with kangaroos. For, because can, there's some other animals that punch. Chimps can punch too, but human beings, it's a punch. And most of the force in that is upper body and shoulder. And so a woman's no match for a man in a fight. So she has every reason to be nervous, especially when you add that to that her additional sexual vulnerability and the fact that she has to take care of extraordinarily dependent infants who are extremely fragile for a very long period of time. Yes. And so she had every, and women are more self-conscious than men. The empirical literature on that is clear. It's associated with trait neuroticism because self-consciousness is actually an unpleasant emotion. Who wants to be self-conscious? If I'm self-conscious on the stage talking to you, then all of a sudden I can't even talk to you. All I'm doing is thinking about me and all the things that are wrong with me and I fall inside myself. It's like self-consciousness, although it's a great gift, let's say, is nothing pleasant. It's associated primarily with anxiety. So we've had every reason to pay attention to the snake, that's for sure. I think I read this week that among, I can't remember which tribesmen it, where it was, unfortunately, although I did put a footnote in my new book about this. Um, these, these were jungle-dwelling 
tribal people, 5% of the adults had been attacked by a python and a substantial number of children had been killed by them. So snake predation was no joke. It shaped our evolutionary past and still is no joke in many places. And so we're attuned to snakes. And the thing is, as Lynn Hesbell pointed out, an anthropologist, we are really good at detecting the camouflage patterns of snakes, especially in the lower half of our visual field. And there's evidence that part of the reason that human beings have such acute vision, which means that our eyes opened, let's say, is because we were we co-evolved with snakes and we learned how to see them. And then the price we paid for seeing was that our brain grew because you need a lot of brain to be able to see. And the consequence of our brain growing is one day we woke up and discovered the future. And the future is where all the snakes might live instead of where they live right now. That is insane. That is insane. And, and I hope the crowd breaks out in, in applause after this because that is absolutely insane. One third, at least one third of our brain is dedicated to vision. The entire back of your brain, back of your head is vision oriented. Vision, just to be able to see, forget the rest of the five senses, you know, touch, nah, um, hearing, <laughs> smell, give me a break. We have no sense of smell. Taste, uh-uh, no, no, no. All of the other senses take a back seat, take a back seat to vision, vision. No other part of our brain is that big. No other part, vision. And, and think of how horrible it is and how nervous people get when they start to lose their vision. <gasps> it's terrifying. Oh my gosh, it's terrifying. You know, cataracts? Ah. Oh. LASIK? Ah. Oh. You know, all of these things, all of these things. We value vision. Our brains value vision. I mean, th that's why our heads are so big and, and just everything, everything about us is vision. The only thing that have better vision than us are bees. You know, maybe, you know, if you want to talk about birds and stuff like that. But I mean, the amount of brain of them that is, is that is, you know, percentage wise for vision, it's more than 30%. So, you know, it's absolutely incredible that, you know, we got vision and we got vision. You know, yeah, our eyes were opened and suddenly there's the future and there's all the snakes. Not just one, but as many snakes as you can, you can fathom. Um, so yeah, is, oh, let me make sure that I am camera and mic show advanced. Okay. I am at 1080p. See, that's 1080p. I'm worried about, you know, how many pixels I'm showing up in right now. You know, that sort of thing. We are so concentrated on vision. It's incredible. So here we go. So there's that. The same thing. And the same so interesting. Again, these images you see in this one, you have the specter of death in the tree with the snake and the fruit. Now, fruit is interesting, too. I already made the case that there's a tight linkage between what you eat and information, right? A conceptual link as well as a practical link. But it's also the case that we can see colors. And the question is, why? And the answer is because we evolved to see ripe fruit. So in the story of Adam and Eve, human beings are given vision by the snake and the fruit. And that turns out to be correct. So isn't that something? And then you think, what role do women play in relationship to men? Well, first, they make themselves conscious. Let's not ever forget about that. Because the, I would say the primary role that women have in relationship to men is to make them self-conscious. And men don't precisely like that. There's nothing that will make a man more self-conscious than being rejected. Yes. And why? Because why is he rejected? Well, obviously, Mother Nature, in the guise of that particular woman, has said, you're not so bad for a friend, but there's no reason that your genetic material should propagate itself into the future. Oh, hmm. damn. 
Right. Well, and it's not like men are exactly happy about being made, but made self-conscious by women. Right. It's a major source of continual tension between men and women. And it's no wonder. But it's also the case, and this is something really cool and interesting to know, you know, we div 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 divulged, di divulged, diverged, whatever. That's it. Diverge. We diverged from the common ancestor between us and chimpanzees about six million years ago. Here's why, at least in part. Chimpanzee females are non-discriminant maters. They'll mate with any male. When they go into heat, which human females don't, when, when they go into heat, then any male is allowed access. Now the dominant males chase the subordinate males away. And so the dominant males are more likely to leave offspring, but it's not because of the female choice. It's not the case with human beings. Human females engage in hypergamy, and hypergamy is the, and this is also true cross-culturally, and it's also quite, uh, it's just as extensive in Scandinavia, not quite. There's a bit of attenuation, but not much. Women mate across and up dominance hierarchies. Yeah. Men mate across and down. Yeah. Okay, well, and that has to be the case, because obviously it has to work that way. If one goes up, the other has to go down. The socioeconomic status of a woman is almost determines almost zero of her attractiveness towards a man, whereas the socioeconomic status of a man is a major determinant of his attractiveness towards a woman. And it isn't as wealth either, because that's been tested. It's his capacity to generate yes. and be productive and yes. to share. Because Power. Because that the hell out of wealth. Wealth can Power. disappear, right? But the capacity to be productive and share, that's, that's a much more important element. And why not be chosen on the basis of that, especially because women have to have infants and infants make the woman dependent and the woman is just looking logically, rationally, and from an evolutionary perspective for someone who's useful enough to give a to lend a hand. So women make all right, I'm gonna pause right now because Justice put this up and um I I don't know when he put this up because I haven't been paying attention. I will be honest. Um he says my hands feel like the nerves are frozen and stinging right now. That is neuropathy. Um and uh, let's just give a, a brief prayer for prayer. I can talk for justice right now. So dear Lord God, uh, justice is dealing with some neuropathy, I believe right now. Uh, he says that his hands feel like the nerves are frozen and stinging. And I just want you to send your armies of angels to him, Lord God. Send your armies of angels, send your healing power to him. Let the Holy Spirit Give him discernment as to what he needs to do to make his his hands feel better right now, Lord God. And um, I just I just pray that you walk him through this. You walk him through this. You know what our brother needs right now to see him to the other side. You have a purpose for him, Lord God. I know you do. I know you do because otherwise you wouldn't have brought him this far. So I want you to present his meaning to him so that he can walk to the other side of this physical ailment that he is dealing with. So we thank you, Lord God. You say by his stripes, we are healed by, by the suffering of Lord Jesus. We are delivered from our sins. We are delivered from this world. We are delivered from everything that may assault us. And so I ask your healing upon this one, uh, whether it is physical that he needs, whether it is spiritual that he needs, whether it is that um, he needs the mental fortitude, the emotional fortitude to see him through this, Lord God, we pray for justice. We pray for justice. In Jesus' name, amen. So I hope that helped. Um, I, don't, I don't know whether or not it does. We've got another um, 15 minutes to go. Um, and I will find a good stopping place, and then we will stop. So make intense demands on men, and it's no wonder. But the thing is, is that because women engaged in hypergamy, at least in part, we diverged quite rapidly from chimpanzees because the selection pressure that women placed on men developed the entire species. Now, there's two things that happened as far as I could tell. The men competed for competence, let's say. So the male hierarchy is a mechanism that pushes the best men to the top, virtually by definition, and then that's that's the effect of that is multiplied by the fact that women who are hypergamous peel from the top. And so that the males who are the most competent are much more likely to leave offspring. And that seemed to be what drove our cortical expansion, for example, which happened very, very rapidly over the course of evolutionary time. So, 
And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Oh, yes, and women share food. That's a very strange thing because most creatures don't do that, right? Most animals don't share food. Like if, you, if you're a wolf and you bring down something in a hunt, you eat your fill. The dominant creatures eat their fill, and then if there's some left over, the subordinates get to eat too. But that isn't how human beings work. We share food. Now, you can imagine how that evolved because lots of female creatures share food with their offspring. Okay, you don't need much of a twist in that from an evolutionary perspective till you start to share food not only with your offspring, say, but with your mate. And that's another way that you entice a mate. It's like, we're going to be better together than alone. Well, that's the offering of the fruit. Well, what's the self-conscious part? Well, here's part of the bargain, you know. I'm going to wake you up. And partly I'm going to wake you up because you need to be woken up because I have this infant that needs some damn care. And so you bloody well better be awake. And part of the bargain is all offer you something, I'll offer you some food, and in response, we're going to make a team, and that's the deal. Well, and that's the human deal, and that's why we're more or less monogamous, by why we more or less pair bond, and why something approximating marriage is a human universal. It's cross-cultural. Now, you can find exceptions, but who the hell cares? The vast, really, man, who cares? The v you look at the vast pattern. The vast pattern, well, the price we pay for having large brains is that we're very dependent and it takes a long time for us to get programmed. And because of that, we need relatively stable family bonding. And that's basically what we've evolved. And you know, you don't get that without making men self-conscious because male creatures, why not impregnate and run? I mean, why the hell not? And that's something to really, no kidding, like that's the thing to think about. It is not why men abandon their children. That's the mystery. It's why any men ever stick with them. Yes. That's the mystery. Yes. So you just have to look at the animal kingdom. And the, like the simplest and easiest thing is always the most likely thing to occur. So it's the exception, the long-term commitment that needs explanation. Yeah. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. And the eyes of both of them were opened, implying that before that they were closed. And they knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So that's so interesting. So their eyes are open, which indicates that they weren't to begin with. So whatever God created to begin with was kind of blind, in, in, but not blind in some strange way, because they were obviously wandering around in the garden, bumping into trees. It was some sort of metaphysical blindness that's been removed by whatever has just happened. And whatever's just happened also made them realize that they were naked. Okay, so what sort of eye opening is that? Well, what does it mean to realize that you're naked? It means to realize that you're vulnerable. That's what people discover. It's like, oh, oh, we can be hurt. So you're a zebra in a herd of zebras. And there's a bunch of lions around there laying on the grass. You don't care. Those are laying down lions. Laying down lions are no problem. It's standing up hunting lions that are the problem. You're not smart enough to figure out that laying down lions turn into standing up hunting lions. So you're not like building a fort to keep the lions out. You're just mindlessly eating grass. You're not very awake. But that's not what happens to human beings, is they wake up and they think, we're vulnerable permanently. It's never going away, right? It's the, it's the recognition of that eternal vulnerability. What happens? The first thing they do is clothe themselves. Well, what happens when you're naked, when you need protection from the world? Well, obviously, look, you're all wearing clothes. You know, <laughs> why? Well, we've been doing that for a very, very long period of time. It's tens of thousands of years at minimum. In fact, you can track more or less when clothing develop because you can do DNA testing of the kind of lice that cling to clothes rather than hair. And so we have a pretty there good go. idea of when clothing emerged and of different types as well. So that's quite cool. But the point is they're naked and they think that's not so good. We're vulnerable. So their eyes were open enough so they become self-conscious and they recognize their own vulnerability. And the first thing they do is the first step of culture is to protect themselves with something from the world and you protect yourself from the world and from the prying eyes of other people. This is the book by Lynn Isbell, Why We See So Well. From the temptation of Eve to the venomous murder of the mighty Thor, the serpent appears throughout time and culture as a figure of mischief and mystery, misery. The worldwide prominence of snakes in religion, myth, and folklore underscores our deep connection to the serpent. But why, when so few of us have firsthand experience? <clears throat> the surprising answer this book suggests lies in the singular effect of snakes on primate evolution. 
Predation pressure from snakes, Lynn Isbell tells us, is ultimately responsible for the superior vision and large brains of primates and for a critical aspect of human evolution. That was tested recently. Psychologists have known for a long time that people are, can learn fear to snakes, but they discovered in primates recently a set of neurons, pulvinar neurons, which are specialized, that's an old, old perceptual systems, reveal neurobiological evidence of past selection for rapid detections of snakes. So that's from 2013. So the snake definitely woke us up. Color vision as an adaptation to fruit eating in primates. It's not by accident that women make themselves look like ripe fruit in order to be attracted to men, right? And that's also not sociocultural in origin. So. All right, we're going to stop it there. Um, so yeah, Justice, um, many, 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 many prayers to you. So you got to take off. I've got a cat who won't stop talking to me. So <laughs> I must do the things. I hope your hands feel better. Um, so yeah, I went from, from one hand to both hands and I can, I can understand that as, as the way that neuropathy comes on, it, it comes on in one hand and then both are going, it comes on in one foot and then both are going, you know, it's very, very rare that both feet start at the same time. You know, it's, it's one gets a, a stabbing pain and then they're both just going nuts. So yeah, go ahead and take off. Um, I'm, I'm going to bring it down to, um, you know, just, just talk from, from now until we got till seven thirty, and, uh, I'm sorry for, for starting late again. Um, we had Mary Lou who was sundowning and the dogs who were going nuts. So I just, I just set it for a half an hour in the future. Um, and then also my own sense of time got screwed up because I'm so used to doing this at a, a certain time where the sun is. And that just didn't match up for me because we artificially send our clocks, you know, forward and back every year. It's, uh, I hate daylight savings. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. So shaman says, be well, justice, blessings, and strength. Uh, likewise, shaman. So, oh my gosh, so the Pam Pam is so wonderful. Oh my gosh, you guys are so good to each other. I love it. 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 The, the community that we have here. It's just absolutely wonderful. Absolutely. I, I could not wish for nicer people. And, you know, it's like, I wouldn't want more people because that kind of screws it up. I kind of like that it's, you know, just the, you know, 12, 13, 15 of us. It, how many of us have it, that, that consider themselves Pam Fam? I mean, I know it's, you know, it may be as many as 20, but it's not many more than that. Um, and the Pam Fam is fabulous and fabulous to one another. And it's just, it's such a beautiful thing. So Justice, here's to you. Take care of your kitty. And we will see you next week um, on Thursday for the, the book club. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's absolutely fascinating to me how we've evolved as human beings and the stories that we tell and how deep. Oh my goodness. Excuse me. Oh, those migraine yawns. How deep and how thorough these stories go. Um, Lawrence says, uh, prayers for justice. Thank you very much. Prayers for justice. Absolutely. And he says, great show tonight. Um, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just so huh, overwhelmed by how awesome you guys are, um, you know, and, and the, the stories that we tell one another, the, the richness of the stories that, that come from thousands of years ago, because, you know, the story of Adam and Eve wasn't just 2000 years ago. We're talking about tens of thousands of years ago. So justice says, thank you, Lawrence and Pam and amen. Ah, amen, amen, and amen. So, yeah, go take care of Kitty. Go take care of Kitty. You don't need to be with us any longer. Go, Justice. <laughs> we love you. So, uh, Shaman says, yes, fantastic show tonight. Much love. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I appreciate it. I would do that. And what, what is that thing that the kids do with the, the heart? <laughs> I don't know if I did that right. Um but yeah, it's, it's just, 
and we understand these things and then our culture tells us something else you know we have the, this myth of culture that says no you don't have to believe blah 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 you know because we've discovered this new thing and it's like no no you haven't no you haven't i mean this new thing in culture is so young compared to the tens of thousands of years of our evolution. We haven't evolved in the last 50 years. What makes us think that something from the last 50 years is going to make that much of a difference? It just doesn't. It just doesn't. Uh, no, I'm sorry. It no, the wisdom of the ages survived for a reason. You know, you, you want to talk about Darwinistic survival? The wisdom of the ages survived for a reason because it's it had the power to withstand everything that we brought against it throughout the ages, throughout the ages, you know? And I'm not saying you got to take the, the Genesis literal or anything like that, God forbid. You know, the, these things, we, we didn't speak. I mean, even Jesus spoke in parables. And and we're supposed to take Genesis literally, but Jesus spoke in parables? No, no. <laughs> you can't square that circle like that. So um, these are parables, just as Jesus spoke in parables. You know, and so I am just in awe of what Jordan Peterson has been able to do here and how he is able to explain men, women, and all these, all these different things that exist. Um, yeah. And, and so I just want to thank all of you for being here tonight. Um, you, you are a blessed and wonderful family. Um, I think I may shut it down for a few minutes early just because I'm exhausted and I'm getting a migraine. And so um, I can see myself blinking more and not wanting to look at the light parts of the monitor. So um, anyway, hopefully we will have um, Greg Kelly on Sunday um, and, and his sermon to guide us. You know, he, he has such powerful, powerful sermons. He did not have one this last Sunday. But hopefully the magic of me coming on tonight um, will, will spur him on to be on Sunday. <laughs> that would be so funny if it actually happened. That would be awesome. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, Greg Kelly is my, is my new pastor. Um, I, I love what he brings to the table as, as far as, you know, his knowledge of the scripture and everything else like that. So be sure to catch his show. Be absolutely sure to catch his show. Real Greg Kelly on YouTube. And, uh, oh, whoo, there comes the pain. Yeah, I was right. All right. I will see you all later. Love you all. Bye. <laughs>